now they they pre-record and send them out anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no breaks. But they'll but they'll probably be like I, I don't know. It's hard to say. We haven't even figured out how long. I don't even know when I'm going up. So. Okay. How's James? Oh well, that's a, his dad. Um, I told you he got assisted delivery. Right? right. Okay. So Sunday, I took James to the airport. He flew to Pensacola. Packed up all day yesterday. Started driving back yesterday. Oh, boy. Stopped in Gainesville. Got back. Went over there. Unloaded. He rented a U-Haul to drive back in. Oh man, he must be exhausted. He, he, exactly. That's why he's not here. Oh. He's home. Good. Hope Sitting he gets in some his chair. But um. Well, he can, he and can then Jeff the met, he Jeff can met him over there, and they moved all this stuff. And his dad's like. Well, this needs to go to storage. This should be coming up here. And James is like, well, in order to get the truck unloaded, I have to put it somewhere. <laughs> Okay, good evening. Tonight we'll continue on with our study of the book of the Revelation. And uh, hopefully, if you've been with us for the whole thing or for most of it, it's hopefully starting to come together a little bit. Uh, but it'll come together a lot more as we proceed here in the next uh, few lessons. So, uh, before we get started, if we could have a word of prayer, please. Heavenly Father, dear Lord, thank you, Father, for this opportunity that we have to come together to study your word. Father, open up our hearts that we may receive by your grace the love that you have for us by your spirit. And that these words may be more than just things we put in our minds, but things that we put in our hearts. Lord God, I ask and pray that you be with us tonight that you guide and teach all of us tonight, and that your spirit be the one true teacher here. Father, I also ask and pray that you keep the adversary away, and that no interruptions or issues come about in putting forth this class. Father, most importantly, I thank you for the gift that you gave each and every one of us and all mankind in the sacrifice of your son Yeshua, the one true Son of God, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Father, it is only because of him that we can draw closer to you through him, by him, and for him, out of love, the love that you showed us. And I ask these things in his blessed and holy name. Amen. Okay. I haven't written anything on the board. As you can see, usually I've got stuff on the board, so a little remiss here. We've been looking at the book of the Revelation, which is the last book of the Old Testament in the Bible. And we're at part 22. And as always... The word revelation in the Greek, because the original language of the New Testament was Greek, is Apocalypsis, which is number 602 in the Greek section of the Strong's Concordance, because again, it's the New Testament, and it means unveiling. And it ties back to Exodus 34 and Moses. And we go over this every week. And I know you're probably getting sick of it. But it's the key or one of the keys to the whole thing. It's unveiling of Yeshua. And Yeshua is known as Jesus. By Americans, Jesus was his Greek 
name. I use Yeshua because there are many versions of Jesus, sadly, but there's only one real Yeshua. And as Hebrews 13, 8 says, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this is the purpose of this book. And actually, it's not a book. It's a letter. And we covered this when we started. If you read the book, it starts out as a letter to seven congregations believing in Yeshua in what we call now Turkey. So the letter slash book was intended for them to teach and show them things that were, things that are, and things that will be. And that's in Revelation 1.19. But it's also, since it's things that will be, it's also a message for us. And really, the messages for the churches are also for us, as we found out when we looked at the churches in chapters 2 and 3. But lately we've been starting with chapter 4, which are the things which must be hereafter. And again, that's where the review starts. But before we do that review, why do we need to have an unveiling of Jesus? I mean, we all know Jesus. If I had a picture, and I'd say, who is this? You'd say, oh, that's Jesus. So why is, does he need to be unveiled? Well, because there is going to be, and there is today, what the Bible calls a strong delusion, a great deception. Where do we see this in the Bible? Please turn, and we've covered this, but this is a review. 2 Timothy chapter 3, please. Second Timothy chapter three. And we're not gonna obviously go over it verse by verse because we don't have the time. For a second Timothy chapter three, starting with verse one. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Two things. Everybody should have a handout of the keys to understanding the revelation. And key number three is understanding, I'm, I'm sorry, understanding Hebraic eschatology, which is a fancy word for study of the end times. Hebraic eschatology is not the same as Christian eschatology. And it is primarily based on the week of creation. And on Psalm 90, verse 4, and 2 Peter 3, verses 8 through 10 where there's a 7,000 year period that will define God's actions and God's plan for mankind, starting with creation. So these are the things that we need to understand in order to understand the book of the Revelation. It was written by a Jewish man not necessarily for Jewish people, but some of the members of the congregation were Jewish. Some were Gentiles. But in those days, in the first century, Christianity was basically a Jewish sect. It was a, another 
Judaism. And these are the things that we need to remember when we look at these books. The scriptures were only the Old Testament, the Tanakh. So, when it says in 2 Timothy, no, this, that in the last days, okay, that is an idiom. It's a period of time. Last days in Hebrew is the acharit yomim, the latter days. So, it's last days, just like we had day of the Lord, the day, that day. You know it's all the same. Last days, last times, latter days. It's all the same thing. What are the latter days? Well, the latter days include the days of the Messiah. Why is that important? Well, it's important because the belief was when Messiah comes, it'll be the end of the age, and he will be here to inaugurate the new age, the Messianic kingdom. That'll be the day, the day of the Lord. So in this handout, mine is all scribbled, as you can see, but from Tishri 5 and 6, the Five, year 4,000 to year 6,000 are the days of the Messiah. So if you don't have written down on your handout that, you may want to do that. And the Akhari Yamim are the latter days, which include the days of the Messiah, but it also includes the day of the Lord, the Messianic Kingdom. And this has a whole other series of synonyms. So when we read in 2 Timothy 3, that in the last days, it means something. It means something eschatologically, prophetically. So let's go on and see what else it says about the last days and how it ties into Revelation. Verse 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. Now, incontinent there doesn't mean that they have issues with their digestive system. It means that they don't have self-control. That they just act on the desires of the flesh. Fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Now, I always find it fascinating every time I read this passage is, look around in the world today. How is the world? How would you describe the world. Could you use these terms to describe them? In some cases, definitely. So, does that mean we're in the last days? Absolutely. We were in the last days when Jesus came to earth because it's the days of the Messiah. And in Hebrews 1 2, it says, Now in these last days, so it was definitely. Back in when the writer of Hebrews wrote Hebrews in the first century. So let's go on. Verse 6. For of this sort are they that which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins. Led away with diverse or various lusts. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is the truth? We had a handout last week. 
where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Hopefully everybody got that. But we saw that when he said, I am the truth, he was referring not only to himself, but he was referring to the Torah, the law, the, the word of God, which of course he is the word of God. That's why when he said, I am the truth, the word of God is the truth, so he's the word of God. I mean, there's nothing earth shattering in that equation. But the knowledge of the truth, truth is a synonym for the law. So think about today how people, sadly, in Christianity, view the law and the knowledge of it. Sadly, many people teach that it's done away with, that it's not needed. Okay, that is the furthest thing from God's word that you can get. Because the Lord himself said, I've come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And then people use the word fulfill to say, oh, okay, he did it. He fulfilled it, and now it's done. It's fulfilled. But that's not what the word means either. That's another lesson. So let's go back to Timothy. So when it talks about never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, that is what it's referring to. Not only is it the truth in the Torah, in the instructions, but also the truth in Yeshua, the true Messiah, the real Messiah. Not the one that men have created for their own benefit. Verse 8, now as Janus and Jambres Withstood Moses. These were the two magicians in Pharaoh's court. And if you remember the movie, The Ten Commandments, these two guys, and they're the ones that had the staffs that also turned into snakes, like Moses' staff did, except Moses' staff ate their staffs, which was God showing, hey, I'm more powerful than anything you have. That's their names. Withstood Moses. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine. This is Paul talking to Timothy. Manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Notice some of those are fruits of the Spirit. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me in, at, at Antioch, at Iconium, at, at Lystra. What persecutions I endure, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's all of us. We're going to be suffering persecution if we haven't already. You could be driven out of a church. You could be ostracized by friends and family. We all have stories. Or worse. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, and wax means become, deceiving and being deceived. Now the word there, seducer, seducers. In the Greek is the word goes, which is spelled goes. But this E is long. Go ace. It's like an A, which is eleven fourteen. And again, I always write the Strong's number down so you can look it up yourself. And don't take anything that I say for granted. Test everything I say, please. I make mistakes. I'm a man. 
please get into the habit of looking up the meaning of words using the Strong's Concordance or other available books like a lexicon. Back to this. What does this word mean in the Greek? It means imposters. So these seducers are imposters. And we'll see when we get to chapter 12, and we've already been introduced to him in chapter 6, which we'll review in a second, that one is going to come who's going to be the master imposter of Yeshua. And he's called the false messiah. In Hebrew, this is a Hebraic concept. It's not something that I made up or it came a different way to say something that Christianity invented. Christians nowadays use the term antichrist. And that is who the antichrist will be. He won't be somebody against Jesus, even though he is. He will be an imposter of Jesus. He will be a counterfeit of Jesus. He's going to deceive, and we're going to get into that word in a minute, people into thinking that he is Jesus. And that's what the word there is used. Deceiving and being deceived. Okay? That's the word that's used in the King James. This is the meaning of goase. So what is the remedy? What is the remedy? Well, the Revelation letter slash book had not been written when Paul wrote Timothy earlier in the first century. So what does Paul give Timothy as the remedy to identify imposters? Verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, the holy scriptures in the first century were what? They didn't have the holy scriptures that we have. They didn't have this whole book. They had this part of the book. Why? Well, this was being written. So these were the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament, this part. But yet Paul says in that part of the Old Testament, or of the Bible, of the Holy Scriptures of the Old Testament, it says, they're able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Oh, does that mean that the story of salvation was in the Old Testament? Yes. Does that mean that the Messiah was in the Old Testament? Absolutely. And you can even say even his name was alluded to. And we talked about that when we studied the makeup of the Old Testament in, in Hebrew, the Tanakh, where right after the Torah come the prophets. And what is the first prophet or book of the prophets that is written? Joshua, Yeshua in Hebrew, or Yehoshua. So, yes, it's all there. But 
We have learned the New Testament and stick to the New Testament, which is fine. It's still the Word of God. But let's go on because we're looking for the antidote. Verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, okay? Is it true about this whole book? Yes. But is it true about the New Test uh, Old Testament? Absolutely, because that's what he's referring to. All Scripture is the Old Testament. And Timothy, in 2 Timothy, they didn't have the New Testament. So it's all the Old Testament. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So, is the entire Old Testament the Word of God? Absolutely. You mean books like Leviticus and Numbers and all that other stuff and those little books that hardly anybody looks at, Habakkuk and those books? Yeah, all of them. Every single one, every word. Every chapter. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. A lot of us know this verse by heart. But when we think of all scriptures, we're thinking about the Gospels. We're thinking about the letters of Paul. Maybe the letters of Peter. Acts. But that's not what it's referring to. It's referring to the Old Testament, which is why key number one in studying the book of the Revelation, key number one, understanding the Old Testament, the Tanakh. And those are the Hebrew letters. Tav, Nun, Kaf, which stand for Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. Law, Prophets, Writings. And we talked about the makeup and how it's arranged differently than our New Old Testament. Verse 17. That the man of God be made perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now the term good works in Hebrew is mitzvahot. It's the same word as commandments. So it's to be furnished to do good works. It's the same thing that we find in Ephesians 2.10. That's why we're saved. We're saved for good works. We think we're saved to save our hides and not go to hell for eternity, which is true. But if we're to serve the Lord, how do we serve him? How do we live for him? By doing what he did. By following him. And what did he do? He kept the commandments. Out of love. And that was the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. Where he said, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And people were thinking, oh my gosh, these people are like zealous for the law. They know the law forward and backwards. How can we be more righteous than them? Because there is no righteousness in the law. Righteousness comes by faith through grace. That's a big mistake that people make on both sides. On the Judaism side and on the Christian side. Okay, people think that if you say that the Torah is the same as Yeshua, oh, you're a legalizer. You're trying to turn us into Jews. You're making us Jewish. No, I don't want to make anybody Jewish. But I want to make everybody that has a willing heart Jesus-ish. Like Jesus. That's who we should focus on. And it's not the law that brings forth righteousness. It's the faith in God and the changing of our hearts by the Holy Spirit that brings forth righteousness. I have, I don't know if I've heard this somewhere or whatever, but we are not saved 
by following the law. Or because we follow the law. We follow the law because we're saved. Salvation comes first. It changes your heart. It makes you see things differently. It fills you with God's spirit and his love. And you get a love for his word and his commandments. And because you love the Lord and you want to please the Lord, just like we want to please anybody else we love, you want to obey his commandments. Number one commandment, love the Lord your God. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 22. So, let's go back to Revelation and back to the deception. And please turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'm not going to go as long in, in this section as I did in 2 Timothy because we still have to get to Revelation 10. And we're going to go Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 11. And again, I'm not going to read the whole thing. We've covered it in parts before where it talks about a man of perdition. In verse 4, or verse 3, that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And in verse 8 it says, the wicked... Wicked, the word wicked in verse 8 is the word anomos. Anomos, which means no law. Lawless. Describing the false Messiah. The Antichrist. So let's look at verse 11. Before I get carried away with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. The word there for delusion is plan A, which is spelled like plain, but again, it's a long E. Number 4106. In the Greek, and the root word for plan A is planos. Planos is 4108. And planos means wandering, led astray. It's where we get the word planets. Because when they looked in the sky, they saw these stars that were wandering all around. All the other stars stayed in the same place. But these stars kind of moved. So they called them planetes from planos, wanderers. Okay, that's just an aside. But let's look at the word planos, and if you look it up, it means wandering and led astray is plan A, by the way. Planos is to deceive, and again, it's the same connection to make people wander, to lead people astray. It can also be An imposter. Oh, gee, just like a seducer. So here we have this connection. Please go to 2 John, verse 7, because 2 John only has one chapter. Second John, verse 7. And 
and we'll see this whole thing come together. 2 John 1, 7, or actually verse 7. For many deceivers, plan A, or planos, is the word that's used here. 4108, are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver, planos, and an antichrist. Oh. So there's the whole connection. There's the connection. Because back to Revelation, we saw that after chapters 4 and 5, which were the coronation, of Yeshua on a Yom Torah on a Feast of Trumpets and we covered all the euphemisms and all the connections with that and again we need to understand the festivals we need to understand the calendar we need to understand the liturgy, what was sung in the temple during these festivals. Specific songs were sung. They're still sung today. Or recited. We need to understand all that because they teach us things. We have a songbook in scripture. We just think it's just another book. But it's a hymnal. And certain songs were sung on certain days, certain festivals, to teach us certain things. All that comes out in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. We covered that. Now in Revelation 6, we have a scroll, which is part of the coronation ceremony. The investiture of the insignia to the king, where the king was given a scroll that had written on it all the things that made him worthy to be king. And what about the scroll? It was sealed with seven seals, but only one was worthy to open the seals, because only one was worthy to meet all the requirements that were in the scroll. And who was that? Yeshua, the Lamb. So as he opens up these seals, we see that. The first one is the rider of the white horse. Then we have the red horse. Then we have the black horse. And actually we have riders on these horses. And then we have a pale horse. And there's very little uh, argument. About the meaning of seals two through four. But the first one, the white horse, some people think it's Yeshua. But it's the false messiah. And we saw that with a number of things. He's, the crowns he's wearing are not diadema. They're not royal crowns. They're Stephanos. They're, they're victor's crowns, conqueror's crown. He comes with a bow, no arrows. In Hebrew, the word yara means to hit the mark with an arrow. It's the root word for Torah, the law, the instructions. In Hebrew, to miss the mark is chata. Miss the mark. It's the root word for chata'at, which is sin. So sin is missing the mark. What is sin? Well, Paul says in Romans, had I not known the law, I would have not known sin. The instructions, the Torah, are to teach us 
what is sin and what is not. All that is here. And as an additional thing, these parallel Matthew 25 verses 4 through 9. And again, you can read them, and we've covered this. That's why I'm, I'm not spending, probably spending too much time on them, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on them. Then we had the fifth seal, which was the martyrs, underneath the altar, and we saw the connection with that with the blood and how it was spilled out and it went under the altar. And then six was the people who martyred the martyrs. And the martyrs are asking for vengeance. And it starts out with all these changes. Sun is darkened, moons turn to blood, earthquakes, all these things start happening. Then we have the seventh seal. And the seventh seal are the trumpets. And the trumpets are inverted on chapter 8. Or they started chapter 8. And we saw that, and again, for sake of time, because I want to get started back in Revelation 10, the trumpets are connected to the plagues of Egypt in Exodus 7 through 10. We saw that, hopefully, if you were here. Not, you can maybe go back and look at that lesson. But we see the connection and the purpose of the plagues were to, one, show Pharaoh and Egypt one true God the God of the Israelites. Pharaoh thought he was a God. Pharaoh is a picture of the Antichrist, of the false Messiah. The trumpets are showing the false Messiah that he is not who he claims to be. It's showing the people that are following him that he's not who he claims to be. And all the Plagues were against Egyptian gods. And here they are again in the trumpets. But there's more to it than just the plagues. We had, and again, I'm not going to, there's a handout for this, and hopefully you, you'll have it, you can look at it later. But first trumpet was hail, fire, and blood. The second one was a mountain fell into the sea and the water turned to blood. Okay? Hail and fire are part of the plagues. Water turning to blood, part of the plagues. The third one was an angel from heaven, which was wormwood, poison. And we saw back in the Old Testament, in the instructions, Deuteronomy 29, Genesis 46, 49, how wormwood is associated with idolatry the worship of false gods. Also in Judges chapter 18. And we saw there that the tribe of Dan was left out because the tribe of Dan was a leading instigator in idolatry when they came to the promised land. But again, it's all review. I don't want to go back and recover all that. Then we have the fourth trumpet is darkness, which again is a plague. And the fifth trumpet 
these demonic beings came out of the abyss and they're like locusts. Well, locust was a plague. And these demonic beings came forth and they're described, but when the sixth trumpet is blown, four angels from the river Euphrates come out and they seem to empower these locusts and transform them, kind of like supercharge them. And they become as horses and they kill one-third of all mankind. And at the end of chapter 9, which is, actually this is 8 and 9, we saw that even as a result of all this, and all this, men, mankind does not repent, and they're called murderers, sorcerers, fornicators, and thieves. Word for sorcery was pharmakia, which is where we get pharmacy from. The word for fornication is porneia, which is where we get pornography from. So, what country or what society murders are rampant, drug use is rampant, Pornography is rampant, and thefts are rampant. So we notice that the angels came from the river Euphrates. The river Euphrates bordered on Babylon. So we did a review of chapters 50 and 51 of Jeremiah that talked about Babylon, and we saw connections to a certain country described in very similar ways, which did not truly fit ancient Babylon. And again, there's a handout for that. But you notice we skip chapter 7. Chapter 7, tell, talked about the calling of the 144,000 male Hebrews that had the seal of the name of God on their foreheads. And we saw that there's a letter. It's called the Sheen. That was that's on boxes today worn by Orthodox Jews called Tefillin. It's also on mezuzahs, which are little contain little boxes that are put on doorposts and they have part of the Torah scroll written in them. Chapter 7 is kind of like an interlude. That's why we talked about how this book is not written in chronological order. A mistake many people make is they think the book is written in chronological order. And they think, oh, this comes, and then this comes, and then this. No, it's, it's written in what's called thematic order. It's based on themes. Now, in the next few lessons, we're going to start preparing a timeline, a chronological set of things, for the seven-year period which is known as the birth pains of the Messiah. Again, key number three. This is Hebraic eschatology. They know that there's a seven-year time period of tremendous suffering Another synonym for it is the time of Jacob's trouble. That's from Jeremiah 30. Uh, there will be a seven-year period of tremendous trouble and calamity on the earth before Messiah comes. This is very Hebraic. The Christian term is the tribulation. So we're going to be developing a timeline for events in the tribulation. 
where you can see what's happening to give you a better feel for things because people like to think in timelines. You have a tougher time thinking in themes. So then we got to chapter 10 last week and we talked about how a mighty angel came forth with a little book in his hand and there were seven thunders and the word for thunder is coal, K-O-L. And I don't have, let me go back to the last lesson notes, 6963. And again, the word thunders is in Greek, but if you go to Exodus 19.16 at Mount Sinai, it says there were thunders and lightnings. The word for thunders is coal. And it means voices. The plural is kolot. Kol is singular, voice. So there were seven voices of God that came forth. And we saw the connection back in Psalm 29. And these vo voices told John to seal up what he'd heard. He was used to writing what he heard from God. But he was told, don't write this. And that's exactly what God tells Daniel in Daniel chapter 12. Seal up the knowledge until the end. Then it will be revealed. And again, we're not going to go to Daniel 12 tonight because we will spend some time with Daniel in the near future. Then it also said, the mighty angel said that the seven trumpets or the seventh angel, when the seventh trumpet is blown, the mystery of God should be finished. And we saw that the mystery of God is how God is dwelling in us and will dwell in us and with us for eternity. And it's called the gospel. The mystery that God became flesh and came to earth and dwelt among men. Tabernacled is the way it's talked about in, first, in the book of uh, Gospel of John, chapter 1. For the remission and redemption of mankind. To pay for our sin debt. That our father Adam accrued. That's the mystery. And the word there for finished is teleo. And Taleo is number 5055. And it comes from Telos, which is 5046, which is in Romans 10.4, where it says, where Paul says, Christ is the Telos of the law. And it's translated as end. So people read that and they go, see, the law is ended. There it is, Romans 10, 4. Christ is the end of the law. But the word means goal. So teleo means reached the goal. So when you reach the goal, guess what? You're finished. You've been going toward the goal, and now you've reached the goal. You're done. Big difference. For Christ is the goal of the law. The instructions were given for many reasons. One reason was so that if you read the instructions and you saw you had to do, the first thing you'd realize is, I can't do that. Gee, I messed up. Oh, I didn't do that. Lord, what am I going to do? Well, you have to do sacrifices. Okay, I'm going to sacrifice. And then more sacrifices. And you realize, this isn't getting at me anywhere because I constantly have to give sacrifices. To lead us to understand that we cannot save ourselves by doing anything. It is Christ in us that does the works by His Spirit. 
And we only receive the Holy Spirit by faith because of God's grace. Grace means unmer unmerited pardon, unmerited forgiveness. We're not good. And then we get God's grace. Because there's none righteous. No, not one. Romans 3.10. So that is the mystery of God. And once the seventh trumpet is blown, it's finished. What's going to come after that is the final lap. The stretch. Okay? And we saw that Christ in you, it's in first in Colossians 1, 24 through 27. And if we could go there, please. Colossians 1. Colossians 1, 24. And this is Paul talking about how he has become a minister unto the Gentiles, the Goyim, whom at the time, a part of the Pharisees, the school of Shammai, thought, you can't be saved if you're a Gentile. You must convert to Judaism and be circumcised to be saved. And Paul's like, no. You just need to repent and receive the grace of God by faith. And the Holy Spirit will indwell you, just like happened to Cornelius in Acts 10. First, uh, Colossians 1.24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind the... Uh, uh, which is behind of the afflictions of Messiah of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the ecclesia, the church. And we talked about that, how that, the ecclesia was the witnessing body. It's not a, it's not a building. It's not an organization. It's a body of people who witness Messiah. How do we witness Messiah? By following him. By doing what he did. That's how people see Jesus in us. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemies. We all know what he said. The tough part is doing what he said. That's how we witness. By doing, not by saying. Verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest in his saints. And we've talked about how the word mystery, if we go back to the keys, is the word sowed. It's at one of the interpretative methods of scripture which means something that is in Scripture, but it's hidden. It's not out of the open. It's not like some crime mystery. It's there, but you need spiritual eyes to see it. Verse 27. To whom God would have would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. That's the mystery. That is the ultimate destination. That's the goal. Christ fully in us. So that when we act and we think, we act and think, like Jesus. It's here now, in part, but not yet concluded. It won't be concluded until when all things are accomplished at the end of the 7,000 years. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that was the mystery. 
This is what's called the good news. The gospel. And it's not a New Testament thing. In Hebrew, it's called Basar, 1319. Basar. Sometimes it's good tidings. If you do a search for this word in the Old Testament, it's everywhere. Just so we found out that Natsal, the plucking away, the snatching away, which Christians call the rapture, is everywhere in the Old Testament. Natsal is 200 some times. Well, I don't know how many times Basar is, but it's a lot. That is the mystery. The Basar is the good news of proclaiming the mystery. That God will send forth his anointed one. His Messiah. Mashiach means anointed. Empowered to redeem mankind. How is he going to do that? By giving up his own life. Whom God will raise from the dead in three days. For the promise of us to be raised from the dead. To be with the Lord. It's all in the Old Testament. But it's hidden. It's not obvious. You don't go to Deuteronomy whatever and say, Oh, there will be a guy called Jesus and he will be crucified because he's the Messiah. And he will be resurrected in three days. It doesn't say that. Why? Because God wants us to receive faith from him. And faith is the evidence of things not seen. He, without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's why. He knows we are sinful and we need to die to ourselves. We need to repent. And once we do... We receive his grace. And when we receive his grace and accept it, we get faith. And where does faith come from? From hearing. And we talked about that with the moments of silence in chapter 8 and everything else. Where basically it comes down to hear. And the Hebrew word is shema. 8035, 80, 80, 85, I'm sorry. Mark 12, Jesus says, this is the number one commandment. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your strength. Shema, hear, believe, and do. What are we to hear? Well, this is another way to say faith. Romans 10. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. So we hear the word of God, we believe it, and we do it. That's faith. If we don't do it, faith without works is dead. James 2. It's really quite simple. The problem we have is ourselves. We've made ourselves God in many ways, unfortunately. I'm speaking for myself, where we don't look to the Word of God. We look to what's good in our eyes or in our mind or to please people around us. So this is all part of the mystery, the basar. 
Please go to Luke chapter 8. And I know what everybody's in search of. Aren't you going to get to Revelation 10? Yeah, we're going to finish the chapter, believe it or not. Luke chapter 8. And we're starting with verse 1. When we do this, we're in the kingdom of God. Why? Because we're obeying God's instructions. We are subjects to him. If a subject doesn't obey the king, he's not a subject, he's a rebel. So let's look at Luke 8, verse 1, and it all comes together. Luke 8, verse 1, And it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings. Oh, it's the same as good news. The Greek word is the same. Evangelium. It's where evangelists come from. It's what an evangelist does. They preach the gospel. Basar in the Greek. Showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. So I don't know how many times you've read that verse, but hopefully it has a little different emphasis on it. Because that's what Jesus did. He came to show the good news. What was the good news? I'm here to redeem you. You just have to hear what I say, believe it, and do it. Out of faith. And what's the foundation of faith? Love. You can do all kinds of things. Feed the poor. And, but hey, if you're feeding the poor and donating to get tax breaks to keep more money in your pocket. Or if you're doing all kinds of charities to get more clients and more money for your business. It's not faith. You're doing the works, but it's not faith. There's only one basis for faith is love. And that's the purpose, that's the what 1 Corinthians 13 is all about famous chapter about love. So, having said all that, let's go to Revelation chapter 10. And I'm sure people are going, yay, it's about time. I just want to do these reviews because I believe it's important to set up the framework. We come to class and then we spend most of the week involved with all kinds of other stuff. And it's, I believe, a good refresher to tie things back together as if last week's class and the weeks before class all join into one class. So it's a continuum. So, Revelation 10, and we're going to pick up with verse 8. And we're going to pick up with this little book. What is this little book? That's mentioned in Revelation 10, verse 2, I believe. Get there. Yes. It's a little book. Now, I'm going to read verses 8 through 11. That's only four verses tonight. And then we're going to go verse by verse. Revelation 10, verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And we talked about that, how basically the angel was claiming dominion, claiming ownership over the sea and the earth. And I went 
unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it. And eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now, I don't know how many times you've read Revelation and have come across these passages and you're like, what is this? What is it talking about? Again, go back to the same old stuff. What is the number one key of understanding the book of the Revelation? Understanding the Old Testament. So wouldn't it be great if there was something in the Old Testament that would explain this? Well, there is. Please go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 2. This is Ezekiel standing before God, the Father. Make sure I got that right. And again, in chapter 1, it talks about he saw the likeness of a throne, and the appearance was of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of appearance of a man above upon it, okay? Just like what we saw in Revelation chapter 4. He's really talking with Yeshua, a man. And he, the man, Yeshua, the Lord, said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto you. And the Spirit entered unto me, into me, when he spoke into me. Now we talked about this too. The three manifestations of the Holy Spirit. There are two that are upon us, and one that is within us. The one that is within us is the Shekinah. Some Christians say the Shekinah. The Shekinah glory, which is two of the manifestations, because the glory, the kavod, is upon us. And the Shekinah enters us, and that is what leads us and guides us. And by the Shekinah, by the Holy Spirit, we follow the commandments out of love. Because what is love? And faith? Oh, it's one of the gifts of the Spirit, Romans 12. So, back to Ezekiel. And the Spirit entered into me, and he spoke into, unto me, and set me upon my feet. And I heard him that, speak, that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. Now, for historical background, Ezekiel prophesied before, during, and after the Babylonian captivity. Babylon, coming to conquer Judah. The Assyrians had already conquered Israel, the ten northern tribes. And now... The Babylonians are coming. Why? Because they have rebelled against God. And God was allowing the Babylonians to come in. And what did they end up doing? Sacking Jerusalem, destroying Jerusalem, and destroying the temple. And taking them away into captivity, one of whom was the prophet Daniel, and then that's in the book of Daniel. To give you the context. 
verse 4. For they are impudent children and stiff-necked. Let me see if I have that written down anywhere. Impudent. The word is metzah. The metzah is the forehead. And the forehead is hard. Metzah. They're hard-headed. And that's what the next word says. I'm sorry, it doesn't say that. They're impudent and stiff-hearted. Okay, metzah means they're hard-headed. In the 144,000, where is the name of God written? On the metzah, on the forehead. They are not hard-headed. They have accepted faith in Yeshua and understand the connection with the instructions, with the Old Testament. The children of Israel at the time of the Babylonian captivity were not Torah observant. Wow, what a shock. I thought all Jews followed the law. No, they don't. They're no different than anybody else. So it says that they were impudent and stiff-hearted. Stiff-hearted is two words. Kashay Lev. Kashay is 7186. Severe, obstinate, stiff-necked, stubborn. Have you ever talked to people and you just cannot get them to move from their position? And you're thinking, wow, must be something wrong with me. No, maybe something is wrong with them. Maybe. They're not meant to move from their position. I don't know. Only God knows. But this is a description of the children of Israel that Ezekiel is getting from God. Impudent and stiff-necked. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. Those words are the sign of a prophet. A prophet is not a fortune teller. He does say what's going to come. Because God tells them what's going to come. Because according to key number two, understanding the relationship between history and prophecy, the timelessness of God. God is past, was, present, is, and future will be. At once. So sometimes prophets do speak about the future because they speak in God's name. That's what a prophet is, a spokesman for God. And that's a very distinct difference. And keep that in mind when we get to chapter 11, and there'll be two witnesses who are called prophets. So back to Ezekiel. Verse 5, and they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. Okay, forbear means ignore. For they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there has been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Okay, can you imagine camping out and you wake up and you turn on the, on the dirt and there's scorpions all over the place. Okay, not a good feeling. That's what Ezekiel was being told by God. You're going into the dwelling among scorpions. That's how these people are. Now, does anybody recall back in Revelation chapter 9 about these 
locusts coming out. And what sting did they have on their tails as scorpions? Oh, coincidence? I don't think so. Back to Ezekiel. Be not afraid of their words, be, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Verse 7, And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious, like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth, and eat that I give you. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. Oh, didn't we just read that in Revelation 10? Let's go on. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, on both sides. And there was written therein lamentations, and mourning, and woe. Oi. So now we know what's in the book. Let's go to chapter 3. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this scroll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. And I opened my, so I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Cause thy belly to eat. And fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey, as honey for sweetness. Where did we just read that? Oh, Revelation 10. Same thing. So now we know what the little book is and the connection. And he said unto me, Son of man, Go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of strange speech, and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. So Ezekiel is sent to Jews. Notice that it's not of strange speech. And again, the stranger is not somebody that's weird. Or strange. It's the Goyim, the Gentile. He's not being sent to the Gentiles. He's being sent to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely I, had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. Okay, so there God telling us, you know, even though these people speak a different language. The Israelites are so stiff-necked and so hard-headed that they won't receive you, but these Gentiles will. If I sent you to them, but I'm not sending you to them, I'm sending you to the Israelites. Verse 8, Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they may be a rebellious house. So all that stuff about the flint and the hardness is that as hard-headed as they are in their point of view, you're going to be harder-headed in my point of view. You're going to be more zealous for my word, then they are zealous not to receive it. Verse 10, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears. The word for hear, Shema. Same word. Hear, believe, do. That's what Ezekiel's message to the Israelites, to, to the people of Judah, hear the word of God, believe it, and do it. They didn't do it. Babylonians came, destroyed the city, destroyed the temple, took them away. It was so bad, they were eating their own children. 
because of the siege that the Babylonians put on Jerusalem. That's how bad things are going to be in the future. Let's go on. And go, get thee to them of the captivity, unto the children of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, Thus saith the Lord God, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, ignore. Then the Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures. Oh, the four living creatures. Weren't the four living creatures in Revelation 2? Yeah, they were. And we talked about them in chapters 4 and 5. And we talked about how they're in Ezekiel chapter 1. That touched one another, and the noise of their wheels over against them, and the noise of a great rushing. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness, in the heat of, the, of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Okay? And then, just for you to know this, chapter, in verse 15 it says, Then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv. Oh, isn't there a place in Israel called Tel Aviv? Oh, there it is in Scripture. So where do you think this word what happened before will happen again. Where's the first place this little book is going to be recited by John? Tel Aviv. Okay? Okay, so I'm going to stop at verse 14. I just wanted to show you that in verse 15. So, notice all the connections to what we've seen in Revelation, in Ezekiel. All the connections. How the people were stubborn, hard-headed, stiff-necked, hard-hearted. They had hearts of stone. In Ezekiel 36, 25 and 27, he says, I'm going to turn your heart of stone into a heart of flesh by my spirit. It's the new covenant where he writes his Torah, his instructions in our hearts. He doesn't do away with them. He puts them in our hearts so that we want to do them. We love them. When something or someone is in your heart, you love them. You have a heart for them. That's why when people want to say love, they do this with a little heart symbol. So let's go back to the book of the Revelation. Okay, also in Deuteronomy 10, it talks about uncircumcised hearts. Same thing. It's all the same. Back to Revelation. And now we'll read it again, and it's going to flow right through. Because we just read it in Ezekiel. Verse 8 again. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat and eat it up. And it shall be, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the hand of the angel's hand, out, out of the angel's hand, and ate it up. And it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Here's the difference. Where was Ezekiel sent when he ate the little book? 
to Judah and the Jews and only the Jews. Where is John sent? To the Gentiles. What does Paul say? To the Jew first and also to the Greek. So in verse 14 of Ezekiel, we saw that Ezekiel went in the anger and fury of my spirit. What that means is that sometimes when you're prophesying and witnessing to people and telling them about God, they don't receive it. They can't even begin to receive it. And sometimes our first reaction is anger. And we're like, how can you not see it? But they can't because they don't have spiritual eyes. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. And without the Spirit, there's no faith. So they can't see it. And sometimes, what is the response of the people that you're talking about, about the Word of God to? Anger. Hatred. At best, antipathy, which is, you know, to ignore you, the relevance, not having to do with you. But at worst, and it happened to the prophets, it happened to the apostles, it happened to the disciples, and the closer we draw to Jesus, it will happen to us. Because you'll get to the point where you can't contain it. And it comes out. Because God is in us, controlling what comes out. Empowering us. And they will not like it. The spirits that are on them will not like it. And they will show vitriol, rage, hatred. Because it's all spiritual. It's all spiritual. Think about how people feel about Jews today. <clears throat> I mean, those Jews that were attacked and murdered, raped, and kidnapped and tortured by Hamas, they weren't harming anybody. They weren't threatening to invade Gaza or anywhere else. They were just living. And yet, all kinds of protests all kinds of anti-Israeli and anti-Jewish sentiment. And even now, even now, this country is beginning to turn away from Israel. God forbid that they do, but as we'll see in the book of the Revelation, it's coming. It's coming. So all this is spiritual. And it's led by the dragon, who is Satan, which we'll meet in chapter 12, and the beast, which we'll meet in chapter 13. Of course, the beast, the Antichrist, and I erased it, being the embodiment of Satan. So, hopefully this helps us understand what's going on with John in the little book. It's a little book of woes, lamentations. And when we get to the seventh trumpet, it's going to bring about the seven bowls, which are woes and lamentations. Worse than anything before. And what happens? It made his belly bitter. When we first eat the word, now, it doesn't literally mean take pages and put them in your mouth and eat them. It means consume them, absorb them, chew on them. Which brings us to kosher animals. 
strangely enough, in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. Because animals that are kosher, that are God-given to eat, have two criteria. They have cloven hoofs, and they chew the cud. They're, rudim they're ruminants. Ruminants have multiple stomachs. They eat food, goes into a stomach, then they bring it back up and chew on it some more. And it goes to another stomach. And that's what we need to do with the word. We need to read it, chew on it, and then go back to it and chew on it again. And what usually happens when we first begin to really read the word and think about your own experiences and understand what the Bible is saying and understand the gospel and the good news and Jesus and the love of God. It's sweet in our mouth. It's sweet as honey. It's great. It's wonderful. But then we start chewing on it and we start realizing, oh, I don't need a lot of these things or some of these things that God says I should be doing. Ugh, this doesn't make me feel good. And furthermore, I know people that don't even care whether they go to hell or not. They don't believe in anything. What about them? Eternity, suffering. That's not good. And sadly, some of these people are friends, family. People we know and love. We eat the book and it's sweet in our mouth. But when we start to digest it, it turns bitter because we understand the totality of God's word. There is salvation, but there's also judgment. And that is what we need to understand. God is a loving God, a merciful God. How many instances did he give Israel time to repent? Here we saw Ezekiel, go to them, tell them. But they're stiff-necked. And they probably won't listen to you. Over and over and over, he sent people. Just like the parable that Jesus said. Of the husbandman that took over the farm and the owner sent servants and they killed him and beat him up. And then he finally sent his son and he said, oh, my son, they'll respect him. And they killed him! Which of course is a picture of Jesus. Same thing. If you're watching this for the first time and you're not sure, please search your heart and repent and seek the Word of God and seek Jesus in your heart. Please, you may be going, you've gone to church forever. That is the most important thing we can do. That is the key thing of our life. One last thing. Hear, believe, and do. That is it in a nutshell. We don't do it because we don't believe it. We don't believe it because we don't hear it. And hearing doesn't mean listening to it. Hearing means receiving it. Understanding it. Understanding the words. Well, we actually finished chapter 10. Yay! So next class, we'll go to chapter 11. We'll, we'll, we'll meet two somewhat controversial because Nobody really knows who they are, but hopefully when we get into it, we will know who they are. And we will see from Scripture who they are. Just like we've seen from Scripture, from the Old Testament, things like the Little Book and other parts of Revelation. So with that, let's uh, close with a word of prayer.
Heavenly Father, blessed art thou, Lord, and blessed is thy holy name. And blessed is your Son, Yeshua, the Word of God. Father, your mercy is everlasting, and your long-suffering and patience with us is amazing that you allow us as sheep to wander off, and yet you call us back and wait for us to return. Lord God, thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to read and know what your plan is for us, what your plan is for the world. It's all there. If we would just stop and look and hear and believe and then do what you have asked us to do. Lord God, we just pray that your spirit and your protection be upon all that are watching and listening to this class, that they may be good and faithful servants, that they be faithful to your word, and that they be mindful that you are with them at all times, leading and guiding them. Remind us all, Lord, to die to ourselves and to follow your Son, Yeshua. As he himself proclaimed, and it is in his blessed name I pray. Amen. Thank you.